Good to go? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, everyone here in person, as well as everyone on Zoom. And welcome to the first CTSI Distinguished Speaker Seminar of 2023, hosted by the Regenerative Medicine Research Team. I'm Alice Sorani. I'm a professor in the assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. And on behalf of Andrew Goldstein and myself, I would like to welcome, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Alana Well from the University of Utah. Dr. Welm obtained their bachelor in microbiology from the University of Montana and then a PhD in cell and molecular biology from Baylor. She then moved to UCSF where she worked with Michael Bishop and elucidated the role of MET and MSP RON, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase pathways in virus cancer progression and metastatic spread. She has continued her work on RON kinase in her laboratory where she discovered how RON expressing cells within the microenvironment are actually crucial for the establishment of uh, metastatic of metastasis within um, the bone and the lung. Um, she is currently a professor in the Department of Oncological Sciences at the University of Utah, the Ralph and William Main Presidential Endowed Chair in Cancer Research and the Senior Director of Basic Science at the Hansman Comprehensive Cancer Institute, as well as a Susan G. Common Scholar. Um, in addition to her work elucidating the biology of tumor microenvironment interactions, and um, she's also leveraging this work to develop novel therapeutic approaches for breast cancer, Dr. Welm is a world-renowned leader in the establishment of patient-derived models of disease, particularly breast cancer. She is a PI of one of the U54 NCI PDX network. Um, she's the chair of the scientific advisory board for the PDX integrator group at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Her lab over the years has generated over 100 breast cancer uh, models of disease, PDX models, as well as organoid models. And she has shared these models with no strings attached with the scientific community broadly um, you know, around the world, which really speaks to her scientific generosity and to the broad impact that her science has had um, in the field of breast cancer. Um, what really excites me are even, you know, uh, some of the more recent, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, new directions of her work where she has now taken these PDX models and organoid models and is leveraging them for precision medicine. She has a seminar paper, seminal paper published last year in Nature Cancer, which really is the manifest of the impact that patient derived model in clinically um, relevant patient that I model can have in the future um, for precision medicine purposes. Her talk today is titled Patient Derived Models of Breast Cancer to Advance Research and Precision Medicine. Now, for those of you here in person, please hold your questions until the end. And um, for those of you who are following us on Zoom, we actually have a Q&A box where you can um, drop your questions anytime and we will read them at the end. Um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wald. Thank you so much, Dr. Seragno, for such a nice introduction. I think you know my background better than I do, so <laughs> that was very nice. <laughs> All right, so the work I'm going to present today, um, I decided to talk about the most translational part of our lab, and this is really done in collaboration with several physician scientist colleagues um, at the University of Utah, Dr. Cindy Matson, who's a surgery, a breast surgeon, uh, and then Chris Vakovas in medical oncology, uh, as well as my husband's lab, uh, Brian Well. So I'm going to switch here to a laser pointer if I can, maybe not. Good, let's see if I can. Hmm, sorry. I don't know how to work a PC. <laughs> Well, I'll just use my mouse, that's okay. All right, so um, just to give a little bit of background on breast cancer, uh, for those of you who don't think about it every day like I do. Um, so we have about 260,000 new cases of breast cancer just in the US every year, and all those patients are treated with a combination of either uh, local therapies such as surgery and radiation to remove the primary tumor, but also systemic therapies, uh, whether chemotherapies or hormone therapies um, to help prevent uh, recurrence of the disease elsewhere in the body. And it's this recurrence or metastatic disease that is the main cause of death of breast cancer. And this occurs in somewhere between 20 to 30% of all breast cancer cases, depending on the subtype. And so this is still a very big problem with more than 42,000 deaths, again, every year just in the U.S., 
Um, now, the choice of these therapies is largely driven by the clinical subtype of the disease. So we have hormone receptor positive tumors that express estrogen and receptor, uh, progesterone receptors, and these are the, those that can be treated with hormone therapy. And then we have another subtype of breast cancer that um, expresses amplified HER2, and this can be treated with HER2-targeted therapies. Um, the tumors that don't have any of these markers are called triple negative breast cancer, and this is still a very heterogeneous population of breast cancer. Now, the problem in breast cancer is not the lack of available therapies. Um, at last count, I think we have 38 therapies that are approved for advanced breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer. And of course, this depends on the subtype of the disease. Um, but uh, one of the challenges that I actually encountered very early in my career when I spent some time shadowing the medical oncology clinic is um, that the choice of these therapies for a given patient, once they get past the standard of care and in advanced disease, is really quite random. Um, and, and we didn't have a very good way to personalize these therapies. Now, of course, um, as time has gone, we have precision medicine, and this largely means uh, sequencing the tumor, trying to find a mutation that can be matched with a targeted therapy. And we do have um, a couple of examples of that that are approved in breast cancer. So um, apelosib is approved for cancers that have a PIK3CA mutation. And then these PARP inhibitors, olaparib and talazaparib, are approved for patients that have germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations. But for the most part, this precision oncology has not been very helpful in breast cancer. And that's because we don't have really common genomic drivers that are targetable. The vast majority of cases, you will not find a mutation that, that can be targetable. So what we're really working on is trying to figure out if we can help personalize therapy a little bit better using functional responses in this concept called functional precision medicine. And I probably don't have to introduce that because Dr. Saragni does such beautiful work on that here, um, but I will give you a little bit more uh, background. So the goal here is twofold. One is, of course, to find better drugs that have better efficacy for individual patients. But second, um, not give drugs that are ineffective and, and come with toxicity. So we, we hope to um, achieve both of those things. So precision oncology, as I mentioned, have a number of successes. Um, you know, one would argue that hormone therapy and HER2-targeted therapy is a form of precision oncology in breast cancer that has been done for decades, and, and that really has made a tremendous impact on the disease. Um, and we can think of several others, you know, EGFR uh, inhibitors for the cancers with EGFR mutations, BR, the famous BRCR-ABLE um, uh, cases. Um, and then, of course, in combination with a lot of discovery research in large uh, cancer genome projects really led to this very tantalizing idea that maybe each cancer could be categorized according to its genomic alterations and then grouped into um, buckets for which a, a targeted therapy would be available. So, of course, this is um, sort of the standard now of, of precision medicine. And you can read a little bit more about this in this um, review article if you're interested. So the um, important point, though, is that this, although it's very tantalizing and there are many cases where this has been helpful, it's really not been a game changer for some of our most common cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal, where we, again, don't have those targetable driver mutations. And why is that? So, of course, we know cancer is driven by mutations. I, I trained in the Bishop Lab, so I'm very uh, thinking about, you know, driving oncogenes all the time. Um, but there's actually many other factors that are at play when we think about um, drug responses and tumor biology. One example of this would be cellular plasticity that um, drives, you know, responses to therapy and that adaptation, which is largely an epigenetic phenomenon, not a mutational phenomenon. So what is the next generation of precision oncology? Here we're thinking about combining both the genotype or the genomic information with function. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where we're, we're trying to go here. And this is kind of a blossoming field. Um, so what we do in breast cancer is we make patient-derived models from the tumor, and this might be from the primary breast tumor or from a metastatic site, such as a lung or brain metastasis. We initially started by making PDX models where we would grow these in the orthotopic site in the mouse mammary gland of immune deficient mice. But since then, we've also started with organoid cultures, growing these in three-dimensional matrices, and all, even going back and forth between the PDX and the organoid models. And of course, in the beginning, the goal was just to ask how well do these models actually represent the tumors that they come from? That's a very important question in any model development. And that was largely snapshot analysis, looking at things like mutations, and gene expression. And I would say that not only us, of course, many labs are doing this, but these patient-derived models of cancer really do have 
a pretty high concordance of tumor genomic and transcriptomic fidelity. Um, they do also have uh, represent some of the heterogeneity that we see in the disease. Um, I, here's a relatively recent um, report doing a meta-analysis of more than 1,000 organoids across different cancers, and they really came to this conclusion that there's pretty high fidelity. Of course, they're not perfect. Every uh, model is, is not perfect um, because it's a model. So in addition, so once we, well, let me say, once we um, sort of determined these, we think these models are relatively good representations of the disease, we started moving to functional assessment and saying, okay, how do these models behave and how do they behave like the tumor does in the patient? And for there, we've mostly focused on drug responses, but one can look at tumor evolution or all kinds of things. And again, another meta-analysis looking, you know, again, this is less commonly done, but in 17 studies, really did show optimistic results if you're using organoids from patients as a, um, as a way to predict clinical drug responses. Now, this has um, now led to, well, what should we do with this information? And, and now that we feel that we have pretty good fidelity, can we actually return this information back to the clinic and hopefully have some impact on patient outcomes? Now, I want to point this out that it's really not a new concept. So this has been around, actually has been done, especially in hematologic malignancies decades ago, a long time ago. Um, and it really didn't take off. It was either not found to be effective or was too difficult. And what's different now? I think what's different now is we have a lot of new advances in technology, especially in organoid and other types of culture that allow these tumors to propagate and, and re retain their identity, at least to some degree. And so that's what's really fueled the new advances and sort of reawakening of this field. So here's an example from some of our data that I wanted to share just to give a, a, a picture, a snapshot of why I think this is important. So as I mentioned in the beginning, talazoparib um, is a PARP inhibitor. It's approved for BRCA mutant tumors in breast cancer. And when we um, screen drugs across a large number of breast cancer organoid models from patients, or these are actually first made into PDX and then developed into organoid models, um, what we see is, of course, as one would expect, there's variable response to these PARP inhibitors. So here you're seeing the dose of the drug shown on the left. So we have a dose response. Red means the organoids were killed at that dose. Green means they're growing. White is a cytostatic effect. And I've drawn a line here that's the benchmark. And what that means is that when we treat with that concentration of, or we, when we treat that model in vivo with the drug, it can cause either stable disease or tumor regression. So that's the benchmark for which we think we need to see a signal in the organoids in, vi in vivo, in vitro to make a, um, an impact. So what you can see is that, you know, there's variability in response to these PARP inhibitors. And as you might expect, we do have responders that have the BRCA mutation, as you would expect. But we also have tumors that have BRCA mutation, but don't have a response to the PARP inhibitor. And then of course we have responders that don't have BRCA mutation. So I think this just goes to show that we need to capture more information than just mutation of the target to predict whether or not the drug will work. And of course, this is borne out in clinical trials and actual clinical experience. We have very similar data with PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, again, which are um, FDA approved uh, in pic 3 ca mutant tumors. So this isn't just an isolated uh, case. So what have we done so far? So um, as I mentioned, we've made uh, PDX, a snapshot of them is shown here, the ones we've published. We have almost a hundred models now. And the point here is just that the models come from all different clinical subtypes of breast cancer, those expressing hormone receptors, HER2, or lots of triple negatives, which would be the white um, boxes. And then we make a lot of effort to collect tumors from metastatic sites. And in particular, we try to get multiple tumors from the same patient, primary metastatic pairs or metastatic tumors, either from different sites or over the course of therapy as a way that we can model tumor evolution and resistance to therapy. And those pairs are shown um, in a color-coded way at the top. Now, the advantages of PDX models is that, as I mentioned, they're a pretty good representation of human tumors um, with looking at histology and IHC and genomics. I'm not going to show you that data today, but we've published this, so you can look it up if you like. Um, I think a big advantage is that the estrogen receptor positive tumors do maintain their hormone dependence. The reason why this is important is because we don't have any genetically engineered mouse models that retain the estrogen receptor and are hormone dependent, despite the fact that's the majority of human breast cancers. So having models where we can really study that hormone um, dependence and acquired resistance is very important. 
Um, in addition, and the reason I made these models in the very first place was to study metastasis. And these um, PDX do spontaneously metastasize in the mouse from the mammary gland where we've implanted it to all different sites, brain, lung, liver, et cetera. Um, so that's a nice way, um, a model to have metastasis. There are many disadvantages to PDX as well. Of course, they're labor tense intensive, they're expensive. So they're really better for like low throughput studies or validation studies than for um, a lot of really good discovery research. Uh, so for that reason, we started to develop organoid lines. And our idea was to have matched in vitro and in vivo models of the same cancer. That's why we made our organoids initially from the PDX. And we can then do experiments in vitro, we can then validate in vivo, et cetera. Um, we do also make organoids straight from patients as well, um, but most of what I'll talk about today is to do with our big collection, which are PDX derived organoids. So the advantages of these is now we can actually do things on a much larger scale. Um, we can do drug screens, as, as I've talked about. You can do genetic screens, which is not something we've um, developed much yet but others have. And then of course you can modify culture conditions. So if you're interested in you know, tumor stroma interactions, you can co-culture with fibroblasts or you know, whatever your interest is. I will note that in all of our models, we um, actively remove the mouse stroma. So what we're growing as organoids in long-term culture are the human tumor cells. And we do that for a few reasons. Um, the main reason is because we found that some tumors that come out of the PDX or even out of the human have very aggressive stroma that grows with them. And in some cases, we would overtake the culture. Um, but we wanted to have sort of a consistent way that we develop these models. So in cases where we had to get rid of it, we decided just to get rid of it from all for all of our models, knowing that we could always add that back if we wanted to. So right now we have, um, it's a little out of date, but about 80 breast cancer PDX and about 75% of those we've made into the matching organoid. All of them have full genomics. We have all um, clinical data for all of them, de-identified treatment info before and after model development. And then we've screened all 100 models for about 50 drugs each. So it's kind of a small scale drug screen, um, but it gives us a picture of, of you know, what kinds of patterns we see. So first, I'm going to just give you a, a quick snapshot of, of the fidelity of these models. So we have PDX, we make those into organoids. And then for some studies for comparison, we can actually put the organoids back into mice uh, to see how they compare, because then we can have more of an apples to apples comparison. So here's just an example of a triple negative breast cancer. This is the histology of the patient tumor. Um, the matching PDX and then organoids at different time points. So some of our lines have been cultured for, you know, more than 500 days as these are long-term um, established lines. And if we put them back into um, mice, we can see that the growth rate of those tumors is pretty similar to the original PDX that they came from. Now, a really important point again is estrogen receptor uh, expression as well as um, hormone responsiveness. And one of the challenges is um, when you put um, breast cancer cells in 3D, even hormone receptor positive breast cancer cell lines like MCF7 or T47D, they tend to lose their estrogen receptor. So we checked that in our models and we found that these do, um, they actually do reduce the RNA levels of ER, but they do still retain the protein expression um, and they retain their estrogen dependence. So um, this is, uh, you know, growth of a couple representative ER positive lines in the normal condition. If we strip out estrogen from the serum, um, this um, de decreases or eliminates the viability of these tumor um, organoids, but we can rescue that by adding back estrogen. So this just shows that they still retain their estrogen dependence. Um, same thing with estrogen receptor target genes like TFF1. And then if we put it back in mice after they've been grown long-term in organoid culture, we can still get nice dose responses to estrogen re receptor degraders like fulvestron. This is a FDA approved therapy in breast cancer. So this convinced us that we do have um, good models of estrogen dependent um, breast cancer to study. So what are we doing? As I mentioned, we have 100 or so of these paired PDX and PDXO models. This is in collaboration with Mike Lewis at Baylor College of Medicine. So actually together we have um, several hundred. Um, but the idea was to make 100 organoid lines from PDX with full genomics and then screen drugs 
using um, drugs that are in the NCI's um, clinical trials program, so the CTEP program. The idea is to try to understand which breast tumors would respond to which drugs and why. The goal is, of course, to design better clinical trials that are um, you know, going to select patients for which there might be a response. So here's just an example of our, our pilot screen that we already published. Um, it was only about 17, our first 17 models screened with 40 or 50 drugs. And the way this is represented is a growth adjusted area over the curve for the dose response of the drug. So basically the darker colors indicate cytotoxicity, the lighter colors indicate growth. And what we're doing is um, because there's such heterogeneity and growth of breast cancers, we've normalized this to the normal growth rate of the tumor. Um, so that you're not just seeing killing of the fast growing um, tumors. So that's what you see here. And um, you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity in those drug responses. Um, the first thing we asked is, well, how well does this make sense, right? So what we did is we looked at the drug responses in the hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive breast cancers. And what you can see is that the yellow bars cluster up at the top. This is indicating that there's more cytotoxicity with these yellow drugs that are classified as inhibitors of the PI3 kinase AKTM TOR pathway. We know that these ER positive or HER2 positive tumors are more sensitive to inhibition of this pathway. So that was a first indication that um, this is working the way we would expect. And likewise, in triple negative breast cancer, where the main um, effective therapies are chemotherapies, shown here in purple, you can see that those cluster um, up at the top as being more cytotoxic cytotoxic in the TMVCs. Now, what we honed in on are drugs like this, where we see, you know, a really um, sort of heterogeneous response with some breast cancers responding really well and others not, because that indicated we might be able to find something out about these tumors. And this is a drug called Branapant, which is a SMAC mimetic. So it induces apoptosis by causing degradation of inhibitors of apoptosis proteins. And what we found was that if we rank our organoids by their response to Brinopant using that GRAOC, um, here, all of these ones that are more sensitive to Brinopant, um, most of them tend to be triple negative breast cancer. However, there are plenty of triple negative breast cancers that are not sensitive to this drug. So we were interested in pursuing it. What was special about the ones that had were killed by Branapant versus those that weren't? But before we did that, we wanted to validate our data because this was still early on in screening um, organoids. And so we went back to the matching PDX. We picked some that were responsive, some that were non-responsive. We treated the mice and you can see that indeed we, we can um, detect really nice responses to Branapant in the sensitive TMBCs whereas some TMBCs that are not sensitive are just keep growing um, under, under therapy. Now, if we now step back and look at what does burn apparent response look like across all the models we've screened, um, what you can see again is some respond really well, some don't. Um, and um, down here is the TN is the triple negative um, breast cancers in our collection, but we also have some HER2 and ER positive and even triple positive um, models in our collection. And you can see that overall it's about 25% of the breast cancers that seem to be responsive to Brinopant. Um, but we focused on this triple negative population, mostly because we don't have good targeted therapies uh, to treat the um, metastatic triple negatives. So of course, our next step is what is what are the biomarkers of response in TMBC to this drug? Why, which triple negatives respond and which wouldn't? Because that's how we would um, de design the best clinical trial. Now, Brinopant, um, most single agents um, are not effective in advanced breast cancer and have to be given in combination with another therapy that's already approved. So in triple negative breast cancer, that would be a series of chemotherapies. So we tested in our PDX models, a combination of Brinopant with a number of different chemotherapies that are FDA approved in advanced breast cancer and would not have toxicity profiles that would overlap with what we know about Brinopant. Um, and for this, we found that the combination with aribulin was the best uh, one, at least in our PDX models. So here I'm showing you three different triple negative PDXs treated with either single drugs or the combination. And you can see that in all the cases, the combination therapies um, give not only a response while they're on treatment, which is depicted by this um, dotted red line. And the first 50 days of treatment are just in the end setup here. And what you can see though, is that after we have a treatment for um, around three weeks, we stop therapy 
and we look for recurrence of those tumors. So that's how we measure durability of response. And what you can see is that the combination therapies in all the case are giving a much more durable response um, than either than the single agents alone. And we look at this in a recurrence-free survival plot. We can see that we have statistical significance in all of the models with this combination. So this is now moving um, to a, a clinical trial with uh, CTEP, although we're using a different SMAC memetic for that because of we didn't end up being able to get access to this drug. So these approaches, I think, are going to help us find new therapies for breast cancer patients. Um, but, you know, that takes a lot of time and some discovery science. So, you know, we kind of started to think about what can we do right now? So the reason why I started thinking about this, what came from an accidental observation that we actually published more than a de decade ago in Nature Medicine, and this was that the patients whose tumors were successfully engrafted as a PDX um, all died of their disease, whereas the patient whose tumors we could not grow successfully as a PDX, which is three quarters of them, uh, lived uh, and, and were successfully treated with standard therapy. This is primary tumors, and we're looking at recurrence um, of uh, metastatic disease. And this was just retrospective data. It was 50 patients. It was just a completely serendipitous observation, but it prompted us to ask whether we could actually do this prospectively. One of the problems in breast cancer, particularly triple negative breast cancer, is we don't know whose tumor will recur. Um, and once it recurs, it's not, it's treatable, but it's not curable. And so as a result, breast cancer patients are really over-treated in order to prevent that recurrence because we can't tell whose tumor is going to grow or not. So we started to think about this and thought, well, you know, is growth in a mouse um, telling us something about the biology of that tumor? Um, and could we actually use this in a way that might be useful? So we got DOD funding and we set up a prospective study called um, Towards Functional Precision Oncology for Breast Cancer. We call it TOWARDS for short. And this was a prospective study that enrolled 80 patients who were newly diagnosed with um, either triple negative or ERPR uh, low disease. Um, they could have HER2 positive as well, but no, basically we excluded the high hormone receptor positive patients. The reason we did that is because their recurrences tend to be very late, and it would take us a long time to follow that population. We biopsied their tumor before they started neoadjuvant chemotherapy, asked whether it could grow as a PDX, and then tried to prospectively predict recurrence. So we had 89 patients that were assessed for eligibility, and of those, 80 ended up being eligible. Um, this is how they break down. So 51 were TMBC, triple negative. An additional 10 were triple negative, but had um, hormone receptors at 10% of the cells or less. So this is hormone receptor low. They basically behave like triple negative. And then we had um, a total of 18 HER2 positive cases with various levels of hormone receptors and one mixed tumor. Of those, we had 18 tumors out of the 80 that successfully engrafted. So the rate is somewhere just between 25 and 30%. I forget the actual number, which is consistent with all of our previous data. Now, while we were engrafting tumors um, and playing with these tumors in the mice, the patients underwent standard neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, so every patient had, the same, had identical therapy for their subtype, and then they underwent surgery of the breast um, for a definitive hopeful cure. Um, and so all 80 patients had that cure. And then of those 80 patients who had surgery, um, 43 of them had residual disease in the breast, meaning that they did not have a pathological complete response, whereas 37 did have. The reason we look at this is because, especially in triple negative breast cancer, the elim complete elimination of all tumor from the breast and lymph nodes at the time of surgery is the best clinical indicator we have of recurrence. Um, and that's been shown to be significant in a lot of studies. However, there are still a lot of people that have a path CR, but get recurrence, and those that have residual disease that don't get recurrence. So it's not a perfect um, marker, but still we wanted to look at it and see how our um, engraftment compared to that. So I'm going to show you unpublished data um, that is um, after all patients have been followed for at least one year after their surgery. So they've been um, on, you know, biopsy, their, their neoadjuvant therapy takes about six months, and then they have surgery. Um, what we found is really quite striking, which is that PDX engraftment shown here on the right is very strongly correlated with uh, relapse-free uh, survival. So the blue line are the patients whose tumors grew in the mice, 
And you can see that um, a significant proportion of those have early relapse, metastatic recurrence, and also um, correlates with poor overall survival. On the left side is the path CR. So you can see that we have a trend toward uh, more recurrence in patients who have residual disease as expected. Our study is just not big enough or powered to see this um, in, in a cohort of 80 patients because the effect size is relatively small. And of course, no correlation yet with overall survival. So what this says is that the um, PDX engraftment is actually a very strong, in fact, the strongest predictor of metastatic recurrence and death from breast cancer than anything that we've seen. Um, when we look at the HER2 positive population, so we only had 18 HER2 positives in our cohort, but there's really no correlation there. So we think the majority of the signal is coming from the triple negative or the hormone receptor positive or low HER2 negative patients in the study. When we look at that cohort, um, the, the correlation is quite obvious, but what you can see is that these, these tumors are uniformly aggressive. And people who have PDXs that engraft and they get recurrence, they all die within less than a year and a half um, from that recurrence. So it's really a very aggressive tumor. And as I mentioned, all patients received the uniform standard of care. Our median follow-up time right now is at 2.3 years from surgery, um, so almost three years from initial diagnosis. The hazard ratio for relapse in patients whose tumors engraft as PDX is 21, <clears throat> and the hazard ratio for dying from breast cancer in that population is almost 32. So it's a very, very strong effect. The question, though, is what can we do for these patients? <laughs> because um, their disease is incredibly aggressive, and um, there's the standard care therapy, obviously, which they're getting here, is not, is not, um, is not able to save them. So coming back, um, I think we have to use the models we generate from these patients to find new therapies that are more effective. Um, just looking at brinopent, which is one example of something we found and are pursuing clinically, there are a few of those towards patients in the study. They're, they're kind of done separately, so it's not a, a complete uh, match. But you know, there are four towards patients in this study that do seem to have very nice responses to brinopent. So maybe there's some hope that we can find drugs for these very aggressive tumors. But in the meantime, as these data started to emerge, um, we started to think about, you know, we know these patients are going to recur and we're growing their tumor. So we really should do something about this. So this is where we started thinking about functional precision medicine for these patients. Um, and we had the ability to make organoids and screen drugs. And so the idea was, could we actually conduct some personalized drug testing on these models while a patient's under neoadjuvant therapy or at any other time in the course of her disease? And could we potentially return those findings back to the clinic? This was actually really challenging. We got a DOD grant for it and we got IRB approval uh, to do this, but uh, it took a really long time to get DOD IRB approval for this because we're not a CLIA certified facility and lots of other things that we can talk about offline. Um, but we did finally get approval um, about 20%, well, about a quarter of the way through our trial. So we, we started returning some results, but we weren't able to do this for everyone. We now have new DOD funding for a new TOWARDS study with a new another cohort of 80 patients where we're actually going to test this out. So, but I'll give you some idea of our preliminary results so far. Um, here's one patient on the study. We have this with a couple. Um, I like this one though because we were able to follow her all the way through the course of her disease. She was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. We biopsied before she started neoadjuvant therapy. We made the PDX. In the meantime, she underwent her therapy, had surgery, and she had a complete pathologic response. So good clinical outcome prediction, as far as anyone can tell. However, her PDX grew, and it actually grew quite quickly. We made organoids, and so we predicted that she would have recurrence. Um, but at this time, this is patient 19 on the study, so we're still in pretty early days. We didn't know how strong this effect was. We actually froze her models, uh, and we just went on with our work. Um, before we froze the models, though, we, of course, want to test patient match therapy because we want to get an idea of how good our models um, actually reflect uh, responses to patient. So um, we, we basically treated with the best approximation as we can in mice of the um, AC and T therapy that she got. 
Um, and what you can see is that the PDX responds to this therapy um, kind of as a stable disease or slow growing tumor. So it's growing slower than the control, but it certainly didn't eradicate the tumor. So this was somewhat consistent, somewhat inconsistent, right? So we know the patient had a good response to this therapy, um, but she had complete clearance of the tumor cells, whereas the mice, we did not. That could be because we cannot give a human equivalent dose of adromycin because it's just too toxic to the mice. We don't know. So we also did genomics on, on these uh, models. And what we found is that there were no targetable mutations uh, as is typical in breast cancer. However, in RNA-seq, we found that the, um, the phenotype of this tumor, the, the gene expression phenotype, was this unique type of breast cancer that's hormone receptor negative as far as ER and PR go, but it expresses the androgen receptor. So it has a luminal subtype and they're called LAR, so luminal androgen receptor subtype, where they basically express androgen receptor instead of estrogen and progesterone receptors, but they have very similar phenotypes. Um, when we did single cell RNA-seq, we found that there were six different tumor populations, all of which expressed the antigen receptor and the luminal um, sort of pioneer factor, FOXA1, suggesting that maybe we could try to target the antigen receptor in this tumor to see if it, if it might um, help this patient. Now, unfortunately, we were correct, and the patient did have recurrence. She had recurrence in the liver, so liver metastasis grew. Um, she actually went on standard of care, first-line metastatic therapy, which is capecitabine. In the meantime, we pulled the organoids out of the freezer and started doing drug screens. Um, we also made another PDX from the recurrent tumor. This was actually from ascites fluid that built up because of her liver metastasis. And again, we tested the neoadjuvant therapy, the ACNT, in this model. And as you might expect, the, this model was more resistant to ACNT. Um, and in fact, it was totally resistant to the ANC part of the regimen, but the taxane kind of held it steady. So this starts to suggest that we have good concordance of drug response in our models um, compared to the patient. When we screen the organoids, we screen a lot of drugs, some FDA approved, some experimental, because this is part of our research projects as well. Um, the result, results are shown here with the most effective drugs shown on the left. I put some arrows on the bottom because these are drugs that the patient actually got. So you can kind of start to compare. So the um, gray ones show the ne neoadjuvant therapy. Here's the doxorubicin or adromycin. Um, we cannot test cyclophosphamide in our organoids because that has to be metabolized by the liver. So we don't include that one. But here's the taxane. Um, so, you know, the organoids were moderately sensitive to the neoadjuvant regimen, which is consistent with what we see in the organoids. Now, after she recurred, she had options for several clinical trials. So we included those drugs in our screen, and that included um, talazaparib as well as cabazatinib. She eventually, as you'll see, um, got carboplatin, which wasn't really effective in our organoids. And then 5-FU is the active metabolite of capecitabine, which is what she got just after her recurrence. So I've just highlighted those here. We picked several of these drugs. Oh, I should say we also tested enzalutamide because of the androgen receptor uh, subtype. This is not a drug we normally test in breast cancer. So you can see we don't have very many models to compare to. Um, this patient's um, tumor was more sensitive than any of the others, but the response was really wimpy, so we weren't too excited about it. Um, we did test several of these in the matching PDX, and what you can see is the enzalutamide, shown in black, um, did cause you know, tumor growth inhibition, but the tumor is still growing. We know from lots of experience that if you can't achieve at least stable disease or shrinking that tumor in the PDX, the patient won't have a response. So we were not very um, excited about that one, but it was the only thing we got out of genomics. So that's why I show it. Um, we also tested a couple of these drugs um, that were available to her for trials. They're shown in green and, and orange. In the organoids, they were moderately effective. And what you can see is in the PDX, it was stable disease, but we couldn't shrink the tumor. In contrast, we had an FDA-approved drug for breast cancer, aribulin again, that um, looked really, really um, potent in the organoids and completely uh, shrunk away all the tumors in the mice. And so this is one that we decided to return back to the clinic. Um, and so we returned the organoid results here on the timeline. It took us a little longer to validate in PDX. We returned here on the timeline. In um, the meantime, the patient did go on a clinical trial with cabozatinib in combination with the anti-PD-1, PD-L1 agent, atezolizumab. And you can see that she was on that, but eventually came off for progression. 
Um, and at that point, the physician put her on a ribulin as the um, sort of functional precision medicine uh, informed therapy. And to our great delight, she had a complete um, response. So all of her tumor disappeared from the liver, all the ascites fluid went away, she was completely disease free. Uh, for a, you know a decent amount of time, but unfortunately not forever. So she did end up having progression on a ribulin. Interestingly, not in the liver, but a new bone metastasis um, popped up. So because of that, they took her off the systemic therapy. They treated the bone metastasis with radiation, and then off therapy. Um, eventually, her liver mets came back. So she had progressive disease at that time. She was then put on carboplatin, which was one that was really not effective in our models, and it didn't work for her either, unfortunately. So this patient eventually uh, died. So um, how do we know whether our therapy was informative for this patient? Um, one uh, benchmark we use is from the Moscato One trial, which is a genomics only driven precision medicine trial where they benchmarked success if you have a progression-free survival ratio of 1.3 or better. So what that means is that the informed therapy, the one informed by your precision medicine approach, the progressive free survival time on that therapy should be greater than the one before. Uh, the idea there is that with every progressive therapy in metastatic disease, usually the response time is shorter and shorter and shorter. So if you actually bring in a therapy that has a longer response time, that might suggest that therapy is more effective. Um, in this case, our PFS ratio of the informed versus prior therapy was 3.7. So, you know, some, something promising, but obviously not a win. This patient wasn't cured. I think there's a lot of really interesting scientific questions. One is, what about that bone met? Was that bone met really resistant to arribulin? Did it evolve resistance on therapy? Or might it have been a so-called clone used loosely that was never represented in our models, right? Because our models came from the initial breast tumor and from the liver met. Maybe we didn't capture it. Uh, the other possibility is what about that li the liver mets that came back off therapy? Would those have been still sensitive to arribulin, even though it would be kind of not typical to put a patient back on a systemic therapy that they had progression on before. In our mice, when we took them off therapy after apparent cure with aribulin, we did get some recurrences and we were able to retreat those with one more dose and get them to respond. But we don't know what would happen in this patient. And so for this reason, we actually started a rapid autopsy program where we can start to follow these patients at the time of their death and try to answer some of these questions. But I don't have any answers for you right now. So where are we going with this? Um, we're trying to see if we can develop the necessary infrastructure for patient sample collection, modeling, drug responses. All of this is really complicated, quite difficult. Um, and also we have to do it fast because these patients' tumors are moving quickly. And so we don't have time to make a PDX or any of that. That's why we're doing a lot of just organoid work now. And then um, we're really interested in whether physicians feel confident in these data, right? We're just a research lab. We're not CLIA certified. Nobody's done this before. So um, we just want to see um, how useful this actually is. And so for that reason, we've opened a second study that's all in the metastatic setting, and it's all organoids. So we don't need the PDX to tell us who will recur. They've already recurred. We biopsy the tumor, whatever site we can get, except liver, which I can say uh, and why, and I'm, if anyone's interested. Um, but um, then we screen drugs and return information back to the clinic. So we're about halfway through the study now. It's very tiny. It's a feasibility study, 15 patients. Um, we biopsy, we make the organoids. We also do the genomics. We even do commercial genomics so that we can compare, do we find more therapies using this functional strategy than with you could find with just sequencing the tumor. The primary objective of the study, like I said, is feasibility and trying to see how fast we can get these data. In breast cancer, we typically have a 12-week interval between scans where a change in therapy might happen, and so that's our goal. Um, our secondary objective is comparing with standard genomic testing. Do we find more actionable therapies or not? And then we have a lot of fun exploratory objectives. That PFS ratio is one, but also this one I really like. This is um, measuring the effect of the results on physician decision-making. So we actually in enroll our physicians in the trial as well. They get um, an informed consent. And then they get a survey before we give them the results. And this tells that asks them, what is your plan for the next line of therapy in this patient if, if there's progression? And then we return the results and then we do a second uh, survey to see whether that changed uh, their plan. Also how easy they thought the information was to understand and digest.
So in summary, um, we're trying to use these breast cancer patient drive models for both discovery science, as well as for personalized medicine. Um, it's really challenging. There's a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges. So I thought I'd cover those here. I think that these functional assays like PDF and PDFs and Graftment, like I showed you, can really inform us about the biology and the clinical course of the tumors. Right now, we know we can pick out the triple negatives that are the most aggressive using PDFs and Graftment, for example. Why those tumors are more aggressive is something we're still working on, but, um, but at least we can identify them, which we couldn't before. I think that these therapies can, in some cases, be personalized based on the assays, like the, the example I showed you. And maybe we actually can extend progression-free survival time for some of these patients. I think it's really way too early to say whether that's true or not. It will depend on a lot more trials. But there's a lot of challenges. So first of all, we just don't have good effective drugs <laughs> for these cases. We can. What good is it to pick out which tumors are gonna recur and, and know that these patients have very aggressive disease if you don't have effective therapies? So that's where I think we have to use these models in order to uh, discover new pathways, identify new drugs and develop them. Um, I think feasibility is a challenge because, um, and I should back up to that point. So there are a lot of cases in TORDS where we screen the drugs with all the drugs that are FDA approved for breast cancer that we can get our hands on, and we just don't find any that look good. So it, it really is a problem. Um, feasibility is challenging as well. So I think that um, I encourage everybody to implement viable tumor banking as a standard whenever you can. Um, and if you think about clinical trials that are done all the time, whether they're investigator initiated or in industry, Many times you're testing a drug, you have some responders and some non-responders, but to go back and figure out why some respond and some don't is really a challenge because you usually don't have the material. You might have FFPE blocks, but you can't grow it, you can't test it. So I think if we as a community try to implement this, um, it's not hard, it's really easy. If we try to implement this um, as a standard, we'll have a lot more material to work with um, so that we can try to understand these and try to understand you know, mechanistically why some tumors respond, even in the FDA approved indication and others don't. I think whenever we're working with um, any model, but in particular patient-derived models, especially if you're using them to try to direct uh, therapy, Validation is really crucial. So I think as a field, we need to set standards for how you validate these models. Um, we have had cases, um, luckily we validate, so we know this, but you know there are cases when you grow normal breast uh, from a breast tumor biopsy. And so you have to have ways that you know that you can um, determine that. And then I think we obviously need these um, prospective trials. We need co-clinical trials um, like TORDS or 4C, where we can actually ask how well our models represent drug responses in patients. And then I think um, we're definitely thinking a lot ahead of how can, how can we extrapolate these functional precision oncology assays to something that's more clinically feasible. I would never say that we should grow everybody's tumor as a PDX in order to predict recurrence. I mean, we know it, it works, at least in our study, um, but it's really <laughs> time intensive, expensive, not feasible. So we're looking for biomarkers that correlate with those functional outcomes. And you can imagine lots of different functional outcomes for which we could develop biomarkers. So I think that's where we need to go to really have impact uh, in the clinic. So with that, I'll, I'll stop it. I just wanna thank the people who did the work. We have a fantastic group uh, in our lab. The ones who contributed to the project I've shown here are in bold. Um, lots of great collaborators in the, in the clinical side um, at HCI, and of course the patients who participate in these trials. Um, if anybody's interested in the models we've developed for their research, they are available and you can look online for what we have and um, happy to share them. So with that, I'll stop and, and see if there are any questions. So this is a... okay. <laughs> so, thank you. So this is a great talk. So first question is, uh, how do you just uh, see the, the tumor fragments inside the mouse model in the PDX model? Whether it is seeded exactly in the memory gland of the mice or in other sites? Yeah. So. Um... We always implant them in the mammary gland. In fact, we do them in cleared mouse memory fat pads. So we do it the same way all the time. 
Um, we haven't done in our hands comparisons between, say, subcutaneous injections or kidney capsule transplants. There are people who have made breast PDXs that way. Um, so we haven't asked whether um, that particular technique is important for the clinical prediction of, of recurrence or not. We actually have a new DOD study um, to try to understand more about this. And one of the, um, uh, it, sorry, it's a little bit of a long answer, but there was a, another trial that was done by the Mayo Clinic published in 2021, where they did almost the same thing and asked whether PDX and graftment could correlate with breast cancer outcomes in the, after neoadjuvant therapy, and they found no difference. So if you think, wow, this one is so strong, that one just found nothing, what's different? Well, one is in that study, they used all breast cancer subtypes, including hormone receptor positive. We think the effect is more in triple negative. They only had 39 in their study. They also did subcutaneous engraftment instead of orthotopic engraftment. Um, so that's another difference. They also included estrogen in the treatment of their mice, no matter the subtype, whereas we didn't include any of that. And then lastly, they did um, a mixture of different host strains, host mouse strains, NODSKID and NSG. We only did NODSKID. So I know because we did this so long ago, it was before NSGs were available that we just try to keep consistent. Now, take rates are much higher in NSG mice. And so it might be that by putting them in a more uh, stringent environment, maybe um, that is better able to discriminate the most aggressive tumors. I'm not sure yet. So thank you very much. Sure. So another question. So <clears throat> it's great that you showed the correlation between the worse prognosis over the breast cancer and uh, the success, the wider they can be seated in the most mice successfully. I wonder, have you just uh, test uh, directly see that the patient derived the uh, cancer cells at the organoids and then to see whether there is uh, such a correlation? Yeah, it's a great question. So we actually don't see a correlation with organoid establishment and, and clinical recurrence. And I think, again, that's because the take rate of making organoids is very high. Um, and so it's more like 75% of the tumors can grow as organoids. So, so far, the only way we can discriminate these aggressive tumors is by growing as PDX. So far. So thank you very much. Sure. But I, I think that it is quite counterintuitive because you can think that the in vitro models are less complicated and less similar to the human models, but they don't show such a correlation. If we have the original idea that the more pro progressed cancers have the higher independence from the microenvironment, and then you may feel <laughs> this is a counterintuitive. Yeah, it is a little bit counterintuitive. I actually had a great uh, talk this morning with Dr. Nathanson here, who it, you know finds something similar in, in GBMs and other brain tumors, where um, the ability to grow in the mouse brain uh, it, it, you get a different phenotype than if you grow in organoids. And, and because there are different dependencies, dependencies, the more aggressive tumors can grow in the mouse. Um, and, um, you know, they're probably more plastic, right? They're probably able to adapt to different environments differently. So I think, um, the, I agree, it's it's very interesting to try to study, but we don't so have a possible solution. Oh, yeah. We're gonna, we have a bunch of questions. Okay. We're gonna move on. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me just ask you one or two of the online ones before we move on uh, to other people. So, um, for example, we were asked whether there are syngenaic mouse models available for triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, so there are a number of syngenaic, genetically engineered mouse models. One is um, a combined loss of P53 and BRCA1 that makes a triple negative breast cancer. There's also C3T antigen, which is not uh, you know, seen in humans, but uh, generates a, a triple negative breast cancer. And then actually the problem we have in with gem models is that um, you can engineer lots of different mammary tumors, but they're not ER positive. So they are triple negative, but they're not necessarily looking like basal-like um, the way that um, human breast cancers look. So 
And then um, uh, the question is, if there is any way to include immune cells in the organoid models to test immunotherapy, that, that's something that a lot of people are not. Yes, asking. yes, we get this question. Yeah. I'm sure you get this yeah. question a lot too. Um, so in our case, we are not including the immune system. Um, we're making the PDX in an immune deficient mouse although we have humanized those immune systems before, then we take um, those and we make organoids and we remove all the mouse cells. So they're just really human tumors. There are people who are co-culturing with patient, like PBMCs from the same patient. And, you know, there are publications where, um, you know, the, you can actually, if you have cancer specific T cells, you can actually use organoids to expand those. Um, and then, you know, potentially even take those back and, and use them in the patient. So these are called OPT, organoid prime T cells. So there are ways to do cold culture. It's just not something we're doing a lot. Yeah. And then I think this is a good question, you know, for you, and because you've shared your models so broadly. And so this is a question about the reproducibility, how easy it is for someone, for example, new, to try implanting tissue and achieve, you know, the same success generating the PDXs. And I think because you've shared this so broadly, you probably can speak to that. Yeah, so um, I think reproducibility, uh, it's important in all areas of right. science. Um, I think that, you know, host mouse strain makes a big difference. So take rates are much higher depending on how immune compromised the mouse is. Um, but also actually as part of the PDX network, we're trying to establish community standards. We have a paper that's submitted now to um, just simply standardize how we measure tumors. How do you determine a response or not a response? Because that's sort of a fundamental starting point before you can start at re reproducibility. And it's amazing how different labs do this. Um, and so, and it will be true in organoid culture as well. Absolutely. How do you determine a response? What what concentration of drug in a, in a well is actually meaningful for a patient? That's something we struggle with a lot, which is why we started to benchmark all our drugs in PDX, mm -hmm. but it's an enormous amount of work. Right? Right. So yeah. what I always tell people is there are so many PDX models out there, especially for the more common cancers. I always say, you know, if you don't need to study your particular patient population because you're doing a trial or something, just get them from us or anyone else. Um, the NCI has a patient drive models repository. You can get them for a couple hundred dollars. Um, if the reason to make your own is if you need to, you know, you're studying uh, your patients or you're trying to do trials or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Is there any question? Because we have a lot of other questions. Otherwise, oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. I have a feeling that's why it was ma made that. Yeah. So um, I'm just kind of thinking, you know, about the other risks of misleading the directions by using PDX models or organoids, you know, because when you think about it, I'm a clinician, so when you think about the general clinical practice, you know, you, we were so fascinated by next generation sequencing and I often see when actually the physicians start targeting bystander mutations rather than mm -hmm. the, uh, 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 when the uh, really key mutations for the growth of the tumor. Here it's a functional assay, so it's a, a little bit much better. You know? But there are different dangers because you have to have a viable tumor and the patient might be waiting for the PDX or organoids to grow and get the outcome. And the physician might be waiting for this report mm -hmm. before they make decision on the treatment. Uh, we see the successes, like a regular success, obviously, but we don't see the, what will happen to the patients who did not benefit from this treatment. Yeah. Did we harm them by using this method and delaying or, you know, treatment? I mean, I don't know if you know the answer, but this is kind of a, always a concern to the approach. Whereas we had, you know, when we had a match trial, when we said, oh, we, we screened 1,800 patients to help 16, you yes. know, but 1,800 were hopeful up front, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's a, it's a really important point. That's, um, so in our, with our IRB approval, we, we have a lot of restrictions because this is so new. So one thing is that we cannot delay therapy at all. So when, when we're doing our work, the patient is under standard of care or physician choice therapy the whole time. And it's only after we return results that they can make a choice of whether they want to use the information we gave them or not use it. And part of that just choice is because we're not CLIA certified. So by law, they cannot use our data solely to pick a treatment, right? 
The other restriction we have is that we are not um, allowed to return information on any drug that's not FDA approved for breast cancer. So it's very limiting, but on the other hand, that way we ensure that there's nothing they're gonna get that isn't, hasn't already shown benefit in, in that breast cancer population. So this is sort of like an intermediate step that allows us to gain some data to see how well this might work. And depending on the results of our feasibility trials, we will see if it makes sense to move forward. But I actually think there's another point you made, what other kind of risks are there? Uh, another risk is that yes, you make a model from this patient, but it's from one biopsy of one tumor in their body, right? And so how well does that really represent the disease that might kill them? And what if we get beautiful data, but then that does not represent you know, their brain met or some other part. I've owned my history show. Yeah. So this is something that keeps me up at night. I, I mean, it's still better than what we have now, no, um, it's important. but it's, it's something that's tricky. And one way to deal with this, we've thought about, it doesn't work well in breast cancer, but it can work in other cancers, is using making models from circulating tumor cells might be more representative of the whole disease in that person's body. Breast cancer patients just don't have enough CTCs, um, but small cell lung cancer has a ton and we know we can make good models from those. Maybe that's a place where we can ask that question of you know, how well does this represent the whole disease of the patient? And then I think piggybacking with our rapid autopsy program, as we start to get data there, we'll start to get a better idea of the heterogeneity of the cancer in that person and how well our model represented that. So lots to do. <laughs> and maybe this is a follow-up question, uh, or I guess I'm still going to make it too close, sorry. Um, so when you return the results to your physicians, do you actually also return the genomic side of results? And do you ask them whether, you know, are they going to be more confident, for example, if a prediction is concordant, yes, right? Rather yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. I forgot to mention that. So generally our physicians are getting, you know, there's FDA approval for getting commercial genomics um, at recurrence. So they already have that information on the clinical side from let's say Tempest or Keras or Foundation One. Um, what we do when we develop our models is we also do our own genomics, which mm -hmm. includes even whole genome sequencing and single cell seq. Um, so we always um, look at both of them. And in our report, we, we say first, if there's any targetable genomic alterations like pic 3 ca of course, um, usually they already know about it if there is, but then we also, um, try to see if the genomic findings we have explain any of the drug results. And that does make them, we think we don't have the surveys right. back yet, but we think that makes them more confident in, in that as being a, uh, effective therapy. But you know our trials are still so small that it'll be hard to know how useful that, that is. is. Useful data, right? <clears throat> yeah. Better than what we have now. It's mm -hmm. going to be super interesting to see the results. Uh, any other question from the audience? I don't know if we have time for. A few. We do have a bunch of other questions. Do we have time or? Up to you. Um, okay, maybe let me ask you just um, you know one last question, um, which is related to whether you have looked um, if the growth of PDX is dependent on the presence and number of cancer stem cells within the tumor. Is that one of the things that, I guess, if Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, many years ago, Michael Clark's lab published a profile of a cancer stem cell-like um, cell or population of cells that could engraft as PDX. Um, I haven't seen so much on that in recent years, but we have looked at that profile and it doesn't correlate that well in our hands. Mm -hmm. um, but that might also be because, you know, maybe it's not a linear situation. I mean, maybe, you know, the percent of cancer stem cells in a sample is not exactly what meets the threshold for engraftment. Probably there's a requirement for some, but maybe it's not, you know, if you have more, you get right. better engraftment. So I, and it's not something that we've looked into uh, in great detail, but it is an interesting question. I think defining cancer stem cells, at least in breast cancer, is still a little bit a difficult. Bit, yeah, for question, right? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, I think we've got a little bit over time. We're gonna um, we're gonna let you go. Okay. And thank you very, very much for the wonderful presentation okay. and, and question and answer session. Right. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks for coming in the rain, especially. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.